Please join me in giving a Piratey Springfield last talk of the night. Welcome to Rebecca Watson. Hello. Uh, is this, uh, I don't know how to turn that on, so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> do I have to do anything? Easy buyers, activate. <laughs> <laughs> It looks like it's going. <laughs> oh, hey, there it is. That's a, his mere presence solved the problem. Um, <laughs> well, um, before, before I get started, I, I want to thank all of you for hanging out uh, this late. Um, and, and on that subject, I, I want to begin by telling you that I am not high or drunk right now. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, but I might seem a little, <laughs> and, and that's because uh, I, I flew in from London, and right now, um, London time is, it's like 4 a.m. next Tuesday, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I've been doing things all day, like, uh, I was applauding for one of the speakers earlier, and I was like, clapping's weird. <laughs> <laughs> Who invented this? Why am I banging my hands together? Um, <laughs> and during Richard's talk, all I could think was Matthew, Mark, Luke, who writes a book and names it after themselves. <laughs> I can't wait to read Richard Dawkins' next book. Richard. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, and during PZ's talk, he had those, those stickle fish up on the screen, and there was, a, there was a thing that said actual size, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's okay, I have this enormous Pepsi. <laughs> so, um, I hopefully won't pass out. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the title of my talk is um, "It's Not Why Chicks Matter." Um, that's a that's a sneaky title I gave it because I'm actually going to talk to you about feminism, but I didn't want you all to leave. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, come back! <laughs> oh, we lost one. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think we should start uh, by defining feminism. This is, this is from the OED, um, the advocacy of women's rights on the grounds of sexual equality. Um, that's, that's a very basic definition, and a lot of you might disagree. Um, and the reason why I'm putting this out front, because I feel like discussions on feminism often go the same as discussions about atheism where you'll like argue about it for a while before you realize you're talking about two completely different things. Um, so, so this is the definition that I mean uh, when I talk about, about feminism. And what I'm re really going to talk to you about is why it's important um, for all of you here to, uh, if not consider yourselves feminists, then at least uh, know about feminist principles and have some respect for them because what we need to encourage is, is skeptical feminism uh, or, or feminist skepticism, <laughs> which, whichever. Um, and so, uh, oh yeah, and, and you know, I don't think anybody actually said the name of my blog, which is Skeptic at skeptic.org. Um, so you might know me for that or the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast. Uh, thank you. <laughs> where I am the only chick. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, when, when I talk about, about feminism with people, it's actually come up a couple of times on um, when people interview me for some reason. They, they seem surprised that I consider myself a feminist. And they often make a number of, uh, they, have, they have a few misconceptions. So, um, basically, I want to go through um, three of them uh, for you. Um, <laughs> So, the first misconception is that feminists are these dour, man-hating shut-ins, um, which I am, but, <laughs> but you shouldn't assume that everyone is like that. Um, <laughs> um, 
so, so uh, yeah, we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start there. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, I think I'm a good example of a feminist who um, isn't a dow or a man-hating shut-in or an asshole. I'm, no, okay, yeah, I'm an asshole sometimes, <laughs> but, um, but. Uh, you know, feminists actually come in all shapes and sizes, and for the most part these days, um, you've got a bunch of, um, like a, a really dynamic group of people. And the, the main thing to remember, too, is that it doesn't, it's not just women. Um, men can be feminists, too, uh, and often are. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There's one. <laughs> He's wearing a skirt. <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I wrote that down. <laughs> Excellent. I'm so glad I took notes. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and this, this comes up uh, about Skeptic a lot. Um, some people think that because it's a website called Skeptic and it's written by a bunch of chicks that we, uh, we don't welcome men. But of course we do. We love men. Um, especially men who give a shit about women <laughs> because um, they should. <laughs> and uh, and so we actually, uh, we have quite a large crowd of men who read Skeptic and, and participate and comment. Um, and we even have a token male writer just to show, you see? <laughs> it's equal opportunity. Um, PZ, actually, um, the guy who was like droning on and on and on earlier. Um, he, he, I, I just saw um, yesterday that he, he put up a post uh, about, it was about Bill Maher, um, who uh, has made some very anti-woman remarks. So PZ did a, a quick post about that, and the resulting discussion in the comments, um, pretty much like, I, I could pull out an example for every one of the points I'm gonna go through <laughs> tonight, but um, I resisted that urge, and I just, uh, I picked up one. Um, so, <laughs> Some dude <laughs> wrote uh, a lot of stuff, but part of it being, um, to put a rather blunt case forward, a writer whose primary output is on the subject of feminist skepticism should not be all that disappointed or angry if they find a limited audience outside female skeptics. If Dawkins mainly wrote about evolution and its implications for old white guys, he would lack audience, but his writings are general to the subject and thus more accessible slash relevant to more people. This is a pattern among those who are dominant. Their writings are less personal and more general. Um, so I, I found that comment really interesting because um, earlier today, I was sitting amongst a rapt audience, rapt myself, um, listening to someone talk about river otters impersonating a sea serpent in a lake I'll never visit. <laughs> <laughs> And it was a really good talk. I really enjoyed that. And it has jack all to do with my life. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about it in terms of like, on the one hand, you've got like the Yeti corn, <laughs> the mythical Yeti corn. Uh, <laughs> and you have, you have a book about the Yeti corn and the search for the Yeti corn. And it, it's really interesting. Um, Versus, let's say, a girl-oriented uh, post on Skeptic. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's about douche, uh, which is, <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to briefly tell you about, um, <laughs> in case you don't know, <laughs> in case you were comfortable <laughs> and wanted to be made uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> douche. <laughs> Douche is, uh, you might have seen it advertised on the television. Um, did you ever get that not so fresh feeling, mother? <laughs> uh, no, ew. <laughs> um, <laughs> Summer's Eve. Uh, douche is basically vinegar that you're supposed to inject into your vagina um, because your vagina is dirty. And if you don't douche, uh, boys won't like you. Um, <laughs> That's a fiction. Uh, the fact is that your vagina, if you have one, um, is a self-cleaning uh, part of your body. Um, and if there is something wrong down there, you need to go to see a doctor about it. Um, vinegar will, uh, you know, it's basically, you know, you're just dropping an A-bomb in your vagina <laughs> and you're killing all of the good bacteria that's in there, um, which leaves room for infection, which can lead to sterility. 
um, amongst other horrible, horrible things. So Yeti corn, women p potentially going sterile because marketers are selling them pseudoscientific ideas about their bodies. Um, I think <laughs> that uh, they're both interesting topics, but I don't think that the douche <laughs> Is, uh, is only relevant to women. Uh, I think unless you are a guy who lives in your father's basement leading a World of Warcraft clan or something, uh, chances are you know a woman. <laughs> you, you, maybe you have a friend or a sister or a girlfriend or a potential girlfriend. Um, maybe you have a wife who you'd eventually like to have a child with. Um, do you want her using douche? I hope not, because it's terrible. It's a terrible thing. Um, so it's not just about women, it's about men. And if you're interested in uh, women's health and women's well-being, and if you're interested in skepticism, in fighting pseudoscience and paranormal beliefs and superstition, then yeah, you should be interested in skeptical feminism. And you might enjoy skeptic. Plug. Um, <laughs> so, um, point number two that, uh, that I, I often get is that feminism is basically incompatible with skepticism. And uh, the interesting thing about this, I think, is that, you know, uh, any, any ism, you could say, uh, you could find anyone um, who, who contradicts it. Uh, for instance, um, let, let's say atheism and skepticism. Uh, these two things are perfectly compatible, but you could dig up an atheist who isn't a skeptic uh, and who makes very uh, irrational claims. Um, like, I don't know, Bill Maher. <laughs> um, as I, I believe was mentioned, uh, Bill Maher, um, you know, he's a pretty prom prominent atheist. He recently won uh, the Richard Dawkins Award, which is an annual award uh, what do they say? An honor for an outstanding atheist whose contributions to, uh, uh, yeah, whose contributions raise public awareness of the non-theist lifestyle. Uh, and there's a longer description that goes on about them promoting science. Um, Bill Maher is so anti-science. Um, he's pretty much the antithesis of everything that I think Richard Dawkins stands for. Um, and, and he says things like this, uh, why would you let them be the ones to stick a disease into your arm? I would never get a swine flu vaccine or any vaccine. I don't trust the government, especially with my health. Um, that, that kills people. Um, Anti-vaccination stuff kills people. Uh, so there you have an example of an atheist who's not a skeptic. Does that mean atheism is incompatible with skepticism? No, of course not, uh, as you can see today. Um, so it is that you can find uh, feminists who make bizarre, irrational claims. It happens, um, and it's often um, promoted quite widely, usually amongst conservatives who really like um, bashing feminists, because um, it makes them look good, uh, and nothing else can. So, um, <laughs> uh, so to give you an example of a feminist uh, who has made a, an irrational claim that's been trumpeted up, quite a bit. There's a, a Belgian feminist philosopher, um, I'm, I'm probably going to butcher her name, uh, I, I think it's Luce Iriga Ray, uh, just go with me. Um, she, uh, a few decades ago, she, uh, she posited that mathematics was a fundamentally male discipline and because of that uh, it, it favors solids over um, fluid mechanics because solids are like a penis <laughs> and fluids come out of a vagina. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, so she got a lot of criticism for that, um, including from Richard Dawkins. He um, tore into their, her quite a bit. Um, and I mean, it's, it's kind of nutty. It's not, it's not totally out there. I mean, to hear it like that, yeah, it's out there. Uh, but, you know, mathematics, I mean, it was very difficult for a very long time for a woman to get into mathematics. And is it possible 
that, um, that influenced the way it developed? Yeah, you know? And now um, they're making some really interesting new discoveries by, uh, by you know, looking into more fluid mechanics stuff. And, you know, so, eh, no, it's probably still bullshit. But <laughs> <laughs> I think you can kind of see where she was going with that. Um, but that, I think that's a good example of somebody saying something a bit uh, irrational. Um, I, and I want to bring up um, another point that came up earlier today, actually, in, in DJ's talk, uh, which I thought was fantastic, really loved it. Um, there's one little bit, <laughs> little bit that I, I took issue with, which was um, the, the idea that, uh, that, that feminists were, were riled up over uh, an evolutionary uh, psychology study that looked into um, the origins of rape. And uh, DJ suggested that um, the reason they were angry was because um, these scientists were trying to justify, or they thought scientists were trying to justify rape, uh, when in fact they were just looking at the, the genetic causes. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a story that gets told quite often, actually, but um, I, I, I don't think that it's, it's very accurate. Um, evolutionary psychology, um, quite a bit of it is bullshit. Um, like, uh, real bad science. And uh, they've, they've rightfully gotten a lot of criticism for, uh, for what's been going into these studies. And I think the rape one is a really good example because um, they completely, the, the uh, researchers, failed to show that uh, rape improved uh, a person's chances of reproducing. For instance, um, when it was considered that uh, a male who rapes uh, may be killed by the woman's family. Uh, the woman may choose to kill the baby because it's a product of rape or may not take care of the baby in the way that she would a baby that was not a product of rape. Uh, they failed to take into account a lot of these things in the rush to publish their study. So they were criticized for that uh, because what they're doing there is they're turning the focus uh, from something that's a real problem. Um, it's a social problem uh, and they're, they're looking at a genetic root for it, which kind of distracts from the whole point of trying to uh, fix things like rape. So I think that was uh, the source of the outrage. There may have been some feminists who, who, who did uh, argue that scientists were just trying to justify rape, but I think in the mainstream, uh, the, the feminists were angry about the bad science. Um, so uh, the point of it is that there's, there's, nothing, um, there's, there's nothing at the heart of skepticism or feminism that makes them incompatible, um, and you know, especially when uh, like there's 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 no um, there's nothing wrong with advocating for sexual equality while um, questioning commonly held beliefs, especially when the commonly held belief that you're questioning uh, is about sexual inequality. Um, and so, all that brings me to my my third point which is the idea that feminism is obsolete, that we don't, we don't need it anymore. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's very necessary still. Um, it, it actually happened on one of the podcasts I did that you know, while we were talking about feminism, the guy literally said, well, you got the right to vote. <laughs> That was the last one, right? <laughs> like we have a list. <laughs> we, we all got together at the annual angry feminist meeting. <laughs> We're like, okay, girls, what do we have? <laughs> Just the right to vote, actually. <laughs> oh, <laughs> let's go to the bar. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so now there's still there there are a ton of issues where feminism is still needed, and more than anything, what we need there is skeptical feminism. And so that's what I wanted to, th th this is the, really the heart of what I wanted to talk to you about. Um, this is the important bit. So a few topics. Um, one is birth control. Um, yay, birth control. <laughs> Seriously, thank you, birth control. <laughs> Do not need one of those. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so yeah, there, there, there's this certain population of, of people out there who believe that, uh, that there's a supernatural sky daddy who thinks that sex is dirty and wrong uh, unless you're using it to impregnate women, um, whether the woman wants it or not, basically. Um, 
This is bad for women and it's bad for men too. Uh, because frankly, sex is a lot of fun, uh, first of all, um, especially when it doesn't end up in uh, a birth. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and birth control is, is remarkably safe, and the women who can uh, have control over their bodies uh, decide when they want to give birth. Um, studies show that uh, they're healthier and they're better able to pursue careers um, or simply live a life that doesn't involve constant baby raising, you know, which is it's a benefit. Um, but there, there are now pharmacists in the United States uh, who are denying women uh, their right to safe and effective birth control simply because of their screwed up religious beliefs. Um, and the feminists out there uh, are, are speaking up. They're asking their state governments to, uh, to enact laws that will require pharmacists to not discriminate against women. Um, maybe, uh, I know there are a lot of libertarians, uh, a lot of overlap with the libertarians. They might be like, eh, you don't want to enact laws governing how businesses do their thing. Um, I'm sorry, but you know, pharmacists, get a license, they go through a lot of training, and they have absolutely no right to tell me that I don't have, I'm not allowed access to medicine. Um, that's what they're there for. So. <laughs> um, and to make matters worse, not only um, are we not enacting laws telling pharmacists that this is how they should behave, uh, but there's a law on the table in Arizona right now uh, that specifically states that licensed pharmacists are allowed to withhold medicine from women due to religious beliefs. It's on the table right now. So if any of you are from Arizona, if you have family there, friends, tell them to call their representative. It's important. Um, when the FDA approved Plan B, uh, which is, uh, it's, it's not an abortion pill, as uh, a lot of the religious right tries to tell you, uh, that's pseudoscience. Um, or as we also like to call it, a lie. <laughs> um, uh, religious groups actually sued uh, to get that overturned uh, so that Plan B would not be sold over the counter, um, which is, is completely ridiculous. And, and that kind of misinformation that they spread is right on the same scale as, um, as Whole Foods selling homeopathic remedies or of um, creationists uh, telling you that evolution is a lie. And, I think it's skeptics' duty to stand up and fight it as much as we fight those other issues. Um, so uh, this, is, uh, this is a cat that looks like Mr. T. <laughs> um, <laughs> I realize that this section of my talk, it kind of gets a little heavy at times. <laughs> um, so I wanted to break it up. Um, this is Linus, he's a cat, he has a blog, and they paint him. <laughs> um, so it's a line is chaser after after each topic because now we're moving on to abortion <laughs> mm. um, yeah abortion is, is big news right now it always is but um, you know with the with the national health care thing going on um, which I've tried to not read about because it it makes me hurt inside. Uh, and I keep telling myself, oh, I'm in London now, I don't have to worry about that. Um, but I do, because all my friends are here. But um, the, the recent uh, SUPAC amendment uh, on the national health care bill will basically uh, take away um, access to abortion, because uh, it, it tells insurance companies that uh, they're not allowed to, to cover abortion. Um, so it would be prohibitively expensive, and it will even um, interfere with women's ability to get it, even if they're willing to pay with their own money, because of the way that it discriminates against uh, insurance companies that actually offer uh, any kind of abortion coverage. The thing is, um, the, uh, the religious right will tell you that the reason why they want amendments like this, the reason why they're constantly trying to take away a woman's right to abortion, um, is because they want to protect God's little babies, uh, no matter how tiny the baby is, um, they're doing it wrong. <laughs> because uh, a recent study came out, um, very interesting, it was a survey of 197 countries. And what it showed was that restricting access to abortion 
does not cut the abortion rate. Women get abortions in the same amount. <laughs> uh, what it does is kill women because women, when they can't get safe uh, abortions, they find unsafe abortions. And this ends up with a lot of dead women and the same amount of dead babies. <laughs> babies. Um, so uh, it, it makes no sense. Uh, their arguments do not hold up. They're not saving any fetuses. Uh, and to make matters worse, the, uh, the Senate bill uh, that's, that's, I think, going to vote right now, I think, um, that includes um, a good deal of money for, anybody? <laughs> abstinence only, <laughs> yes, abstinence only education. Um, which causes more unwanted pregnancies, which causes more abortions. <laughs> You're doing it wrong. <laughs> At every moment, they do it wrong, and they put more women's lives at risk. Um, and so it's, a, it's another thing that I, I think that skeptics and atheists need to fight. Because, um, you know, they're trying to protect us from dirty sluts who want abortions. Um, that's one out of three American women uh, in their lifetime will get an abortion. So you're talking about a huge percentage of women. Um, and, and also on that topic, a lot of people, uh, well, because the religious right promotes this image, a lot of people think of people who go get abortions as, uh, as teenagers getting knocked up. Um, it's quite often uh, older women, women who are already mothers. Um, the Stupak Amendment, in fact, the way it is currently written, it will even affect women who have miscarriages. What happens when you have a miscarriage is that your body, uh, the, the, the fetus dies, but your body uh, still needs to expel the fetus. And often, um, unfortunately, uh, your body doesn't always do what you need it to do. And so women have to go in for surgery. And they call that an abortion. It's the exact same thing. Um, the amendment uh, says that you can have an abortion if the mother's life is at risk but it doesn't specify if the mother, um, if she would have some long-term disability following this. Uh, because if you leave the miscarriage in a woman, um, she could end up infertile, she could end up with all sorts of terrible, terrible things happening to her. Um, so she would no longer have access to an abortion because of this amendment. So uh, it, it affects many more people than um, the Catholics, the Christians would have you believe. Minus break. <laughs> He's riding a motorcycle. <sighs> okay. Um, next up, female genital mutilation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, Ayan Hirsi Ali uh, wrote one of the best atheist books of the past decade called Infidel. Uh, anybody here read it? Yes, good. Um, more of you should. Uh, basically, uh, in Infidel, she details her life um, fighting against the misogyny and abuse of her fundamentalist Muslim upbringing. Um, and one of the most vivid and horrifying stories she tells is how as a child, um, family friends strapped her down and uh, chopped off uh, very important bits of her. Um, and she, uh, she describes it, I, I'm not giving you the detailed version, but um, in part she says, uh, she, she mentions that the practice does predate Islam, uh, but she says in Somalia where virtually every girl is excised, the practice is always justified in the name of Islam. Uncircumcised girls will be possessed by devils, fall into vice and perdition, and become whores. Imams never discourage the practice because it keeps girls pure. Um, so, I mean, this happens uh, not just in Somalia. It happens uh, around the world, um, usually in rural communities. It happens in the United States, in fact. The, uh, the reasons why do vary tradition, uh, the religion, cleanliness, preservation of virginity, better marriage prospects, um, enhancement of male sexual pleasure, that's always important, um, and prevention of promiscuity. Um, all of these are demonstrably false. This is another example of lies, aka pseudoscience, aka the things that we all fight against. Um, here you have an example of women who are literally being mutilated. Um, millions, millions and millions of girls. 
And uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's something that, that we need to step up and, and fight. Because um, right now the, the work is being done by, by feminists. Uh, feminist organizations are doing this. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, and until, uh, until the 1950s, uh, female genital mutilation was actually uh, regularly performed by doctors um, in the US, England, other Western countries as a cure for lesbianism, masturbation, hysteria, epilepsy, and other so-called female deviances. Um, so, I mean, if you ever hear of feminists expressing um, some kind of skepticism about the medical industry, it's reasons like that, that's, that's why. You know, not to say that they're always right or even justified, but just to give you an idea of one of the things that kind of goes into that, that feeds into that paranoia. Um, so the U.S. outlawed the, the, the process in, in 1997, but there are still pockets of, of usually immigrants um, who have brought the, the practice here. And the thing is, even though it was outlawed, and yeah, that was 1997, um, there's actually been little to no assistance given to the communities where it's needed to help get these girls out of those families, to make sure that they're not being mutilated. It's happening on kitchen tables, you know. Um, and these girls are young and scared and freaked out, and so are there any family members who might want to help and they don't know where to go. So uh, there, there are several though, uh, grassroots organizations that are doing the work. Uh, there's one in New York uh, called the Saudi Yatu Center for African Women, and also the women's rights groups, uh, group Equality Now. Um, both of those organizations are focused on lending community level support to these girls. Um, okay, Linus Brake. He's a loaf of bread. <laughs> oh. um, uh, okay. Should I leave it up there? It kind of grows on you, right? I don't know what it is. It's so bizarre. Um, okay, uh, this is the last one um, witchcraft. Uh, and when most people Think of witches, they, they picture you know, the Halloween costume, uh, the Monty Python, you know, she's a witch. Um, and and you know, at best, uh, they might remember that you know, in the States, uh, witches were put to death at some time in the distant past. That's all done now. Uh, but the thing is, um, in royal communities around the world, it's still happening, um, and in a very bad, bad way. Um, for instance, uh, when uh, when people suddenly fall ill, uh, when crops fail, when things go wrong and these small uh, communities don't really know how to explain it, they turn to superstition. And a big part of that superstition is often witches. Uh, and as an example, Tanzania. Um, in Tanzania is a woman named Juliana Bernard. She grew up there. Um, and she was lucky enough to have parents who taught her uh, that as she says, illness is caused by disease and germs, not bad spirits. It's a really simple idea, but a really powerful one, because Juliana uh, took that idea, and uh, she went out and tried to help the old women, usually, who are being murdered because they're suspected of being witches. Um, she talks about how, how old women come to be targeted. Um, she says that because women are seen as property um, who aren't allowed to uh, to own anything of their own, it's all their husbands. Um, they, they have no rights except for widows because when the husband dies everything goes to the widow and now she actually has some sort of power. So these old widows um, are seen as very ripe targets. Um, and it's, it's really fascinating, she goes into a lot of other uh, little things like the fact that women for the most part would work over stoves their entire lives, stoves like wood burning stoves put out a lot of smoke and it clouds up their eyes, makes their eyes all red, and makes them look like demons. And it just feeds into this idea that they're these otherworldly creatures. Um, so she, uh, she went out and um, she, she joined this organization where basically she travels around Africa and uh, informs these communities of what actually causes diseases. She gives the women new stoves uh, that don't put out so much smoke so their eyes clear up. And she's actually making a huge difference. Um, a reporter named Johan uh, Hari, uh, he writes for The Independent, 
um, he traveled to a village where Juliana was working, and I highly recommend you, you look up, uh, if you Google uh, her name uh, or his, Johan Hari, um, you'll, you'll find this amazing article all about her. And uh, he spoke to, to some of the locals that she had been working with for a while, and uh, one said, uh, before we thought old women were wicked and we could beat them or do anything we liked to them to stop them. But then Juliana explained that disease and germs make you sick, not witches. Uh, her organization proved it. Before we blamed polio on witches and punished them, but it didn't stop polio. Then we got the polio vaccinations and we all stopped developing polio. We could see that modern medicine works. Uh, Hari, the, the reporter, goes on to say that just the smallest drop of rationality can, it seems, kill these superstitions stone dead. One old woman in the village tells me, before you couldn't sleep at night, you were just waiting for the accusation, which, which, now we can walk the village freely, even late at night. Now I'm just like anyone else. Um, he goes on to describe uh, women's horrifying tales of being brutally murdered or nearly murdered um, in their own homes for the crime of being an older woman. Um, and, and with the simple act of traveling to these villages and passing along this information, now these women can live out their lives. Um, so it, I, I think it's, it's important to remember that it's not just, when, you know, you hear about skeptical organizations uh, who, are, who are doing work. You probably know about um, the James Randi Educational Foundation, you know about Skep, uh, Skeptic Magazine and, and, and PSYCOP, and they're all great organizations, but you probably haven't heard about Juliana's organization. But she's traveling from town to town debunking witches. <laughs> That's like exactly what we do or what we want to do. And she's making a huge difference. And I, I think that right now uh, the, the feminists are, are promoting her. The skeptics and non-believers should be as well. We should all be united on this front, um, helping each other out and uh, telling the world about these women and supporting these women and what they're doing. Um, and it's, it's not just Africa. Um, from 2003 to 2008, about 750 people, mostly old women, uh, are estimated to have been killed in rural India in witch hunts. Hundreds more have been tortured and harassed. Uh, in 2008, more than 50 people were killed in uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, so it, you know, it happens all over the world. Um, at the end of Hari's column, he points out that until a few centuries ago, the people of Massachusetts were murdering witches until rational people spoke up and changed things. Uh, so these are just a few of the things that, that feminists have been fighting for, both, uh, both here and abroad. Um, that, that one's for PZ. <laughs> He's a little squid. Um, <laughs> so uh, there, I, I think that there are, there are five basic stages of, of disbelief. Um, I think you start out by believing everything, and then you realize that there's one thing that's bullshit, and then you realize that there's a lot of things that's bullshit. Uh, and then maybe you, you adopt a label. Um, you call yourself a skeptic or an atheist. And most people are comfortable there, which is totally cool. Um, you read the blogs, you buy the books, you come to the conferences, um, and it's all a, a, a good lot of fun. Uh, but then there's this, the next stage, which is uh, saying, oh, I can actually do something about that. I can, I can help. So um, I just want to uh, sort of end by, by telling you that, that you, you can help. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do. Uh, you can give your time or your money to some really fantastic organizations, and there are a few of them um, that you might not have heard of that are doing this sort of skeptical activism, uh, but with a feminist bent. You can, uh, you can get out the vote, you can call your representatives, um, call them about the, uh, the abortion issues, the birth control issues, um, call them just to say hi. They need to know you're there and that they work for you. Because <laughs> uh, I think a lot of people don't really use that to your advantage. Um, you can get online. Uh, I always recommend that you know, if, you, if you want to see more feminist stories out there in the skeptical and atheist blogosphere, send links to your favorite bloggers because I mean, most of the stuff that we put up on Skeptic comes from readers sending us in links. Um, if there's a particular topic that you're passionate about that isn't being covered, then you can start your own blog or your own podcast. It's really, really easy, and I help a lot of people get started. So if you need any help, email me, uh, Rebecca at Skeptic. So um, you can do that. Um, you can also visit 
feminist blogs uh, to learn more about feminism and also to promote rationality because uh, you know they they overlap but there are still very irrational feminists out there um, who who could really use that skeptical voice and they need to realize that skeptics are welcoming to them and that we can learn a lot from each other. Um, so there's that. Making sure I've covered everything. <laughs> um, oh, and yeah, actually to give you a, a good example of that, um, this week the U.S. Prevention Services Task Force issued new guidelines for breast cancer screening. Um, previously they had stated that women should get screened for breast cancer starting at the age of 40, but they looked at the evidence and they decided to back it up. You don't have to get screened regularly until you're 50, um, most women that is. If, you, if you're high risk, then you follow your doctor's orders. You go in as early as you need to. The uh, two prominent feminist blogs uh, called this patronizing and uh, claimed that, the, the, that this recommendation was only done so that, uh, first of all, for money, um, that's usually at the heart of it, and then also because uh, doctors were worried about women being anxious over mammograms and poor little girls can't handle a mammogram, uh, which isn't true at all. Um, the reason why the anxiety thing is mentioned in the, in the change in recommendation is because it, there's a whole lot of anxiety when your doctor tells you you have cancer and then, oh, actually you don't. Because uh, that's the problem with getting screened earlier. You get a lot of, um, of false positives. Uh, so uh, it, it, I went on and I, um, I posted a blog entry on Skeptic about it. And also I noticed that on one of the blogs, a lot of the commenters came in and offered that exact rational viewpoint. They, they actually read the research and corrected the original poster. And it's so important. And that's the great thing about being online is that you have that back and forth. So I recommend that you add a few um, feminist sites to your, your blog role. Um, and I also wanted to give you a, a quick list of currently uh, skeptical feminist blogs. Um, you've got Skeptic, of course. Um, Amanda Marka is great. She was at uh, the Amazing Meeting in Vegas this year. She uh, writes at pandagon.net. Bug Girl is uh, an entomologist who writes occasionally at Skeptic, has her own blog. PZ often covers um, some really important feminist topics, usually when religion is trying to stamp all over the woman's. Um, he steps in. Mike the Mad Biologist, another one. Greg Layden and Isis, um, all on science blogs, all have really fantastic um, skeptical feminist posts. Uh, so I'll wrap it up. Um, I just wanted to talk very briefly at the end about the fact that I'm the only woman to have walked on stage <laughs> this weekend. Um, this has been a fantastic conference. I've really enjoyed it. Um, but it's, a, it's an important topic to bring up, especially since I'm talking about feminism and everything. Uh, and it, this happens, uh, it comes up a lot because every conference is like this. Um, even the amazing meeting in Vegas, it's one of the biggest skeptical conferences we've got. And um, every year, it seems like it's, it's actually like fewer and fewer women. There's only, um, usually it's like 30% women in the audience. Um, and uh, I found, I, I, I made this little chart um, for, uh, on Skeptic about when, when, when the TAM6 speakers were announced. Um, 17 dudes and one chick. And the one chick was Sharon Begley um, from Newsweek. She's a Newsweek science colonists and DJ's laughing because he knows what a jerk she is. <laughs> like she is not good for science. <laughs> She's, she writes a lot of anti-science screeds for Newsweek. She's pretty much an embarrassment to women and skeptics and women skeptics. So um, it was pretty sad. Uh, and the transsexual thing, it's it was sort of a joke, but not really. Like, it'd be awesome to have, uh, there, there are actually a lot of them. They read, a lot of them read Skeptic and comment, and uh, I'd love to hear from them. Uh, because the thing is, when you, when you have these people with uh, very different viewpoints that you don't normally hear, you, you learn a lot. You know, you, you get an entirely different, different viewpoint. So we benefit greatly by, by getting more women on the stage. There was, a, uh, there was a study, there have been a lot of studies actually about uh, the way women respond to role models. 
And uh, to, to give you one example, in 2002, a team at Harvard handed out a bunch of advanced math tests to a group of women. And what they found was that when the exams were administered by a woman uh, who was pre presented as a very successful mathematician, the women in the study performed better. Um, they got better scores. And when they, were self, when they did self-evaluation, they thought that they were better, too. <laughs> they thought that they were smarter. Um, that's just one of a, a ton of studies that show us that it, it actually does help. Um, so when we put more women on the stage, we actually do inspire other women um, to come out to more skeptics conferences, to be more awesome. <laughs> um, it, it's actually very important. Um, and we get the benefit of the, uh, the, new, the new viewpoint. So, uh, you know, that, I, we, what often comes up when I suggest this is, um, well, that's, uh, that's reverse sexism or something, which doesn't exist, by the way, it's just sexism. Um, but it's not, <laughs> uh, because what, what I'm, when, when people say that that's sexist to, to, to go out and get more women to put on the, the stage, what they're implying or even saying outright is that in order to put a woman on the stage, you have to find someone who's less qualified, who's not as good as the man who would have had that space instead, which is um, bullshit. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I like this crowd. <laughs> um, no, there are, there are tons, there are tons and tons and tons of awesome women out there. This is just a very brief uh, <laughs> list. Um, this is the list um, the skeptic readers came up with after I posted that chart. Um, the comments immediately filled <laughs> with um, all these, these fantastic names. Um, women like, you know, Jeannie Scott, Carolyn Porco, uh, Pamela Gay, Jennifer Hecht, Jennifer Ouellette, Sue Blackmore. These are really amazing women um, who, if I enjoyed the conference, and I, I said, oh yeah, I, I really did, I really had a great time. And he asked if I uh, would be at all interested in coming back next year. And what I told him was, yeah, no, I would love to come back next year, but um, only if, if two more women <laughs> come with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so with that, I hope to see you all next year. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There she is. You can just just pick. <laughs> I'll just cradle my caffeine. Uh, thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. I just wanted to uh, kind of clarify something. Uh, I discovered feminism through Robin Morgan and her book Word of a Woman a long time ago. I uh, highly recommend it. And talking about the uh, female genital mutilation, it's important to point out that when you hear the term female circumcision, don't be fooled. It's the same thing. Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. Um, female circumcision, uh, it, it, it's called that quite a bit. Um, but it, it's, and that makes it sound analogous to male circumcision, which it's totally not. Um, it, would be, uh, it would be the equivalent of cutting all the way into your shaft. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I love you. Yeah, br brilliant, lovely talk, Rebecca, thank you. As a gay man, I like that you're raising awareness about these sorts of issues, feminist issues. I know you also talk um, and champion LGBT issues, so I appreciate that. I have a question about female genital mutilation. The last time Ayan Hirsi Ali was on our radio show, Point of Inquiry, she uh, spoke like you did about the atrocity of female genital mutilation. I asked her about male genital mutilation and she uh, had to plead some kind of ignorance. She said, well, I've heard some arguments that male, circumci male circumcision helps with hygiene, etc. And I think that's an open debate. I, I'm skeptical of those sorts of claims and I think uh, medical science today is debating it. I want your take. Uh, yeah, well, um, 
I, I, I do have an opinion on it, actually, um, which almost seems unfair because I don't have a penis and I <laughs> don't have a child with one yet to make that decision. But um, I, I think that, you know, there was a the study that came out that showed uh, that, well, first of all, okay, first of all, the cleanliness issue. Um, dudes, try harder. <laughs> <laughs> Not that complicated. <laughs> All your machinery's on the outside. It's very easy, okay? Um, <laughs> uh, but the, the second point is that um, there, there was a study that came out that showed, uh, suggested that um, being circumcised reduced your chances of transmitting uh, or, I, I actually, I'm not sure if it was it transmitting and receiving uh, HIV. I'm not really sure, actually. It was one or the other, but it did show a reduction, uh, so it made it slightly safer. But uh, the, the thing is, um, it's not to such a degree that you would want to encourage people to get circumcised as a way to prevent HIV. It's not that good. And it's nowhere near as good as just wearing a fucking condom. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> like, <laughs> so, like, really, what, I mean, what we need to do is not circumcise more kids. What we need to do is kick the Catholic Church out of Africa. <laughs> hey, Rebecca, thanks for the talk. Um, I plan on going to TAM this year, and I'm always anxious to see more women uh, speaking. And, um, and I'm just curious if we all need to tweet this list to Phil. Does he need to see this so that we can encourage that? Phil has seen the list <laughs> many times. <laughs> Comes up every time we hang out. Um, yeah, so the JREF, I, I, I love the JREF, um, and I think they put on a wonderful conference, and I encourage everybody to go to TAM because it's, it's a hoot, as we say. No one says that. I don't know why I said that. Um, but uh, yeah, um, they, they, they put a lot of work into, into TAM. And uh, they, um, one of their goals is not feminism. Uh, increasing the number of female uh, speakers is not one of their goals. And I, uh, I understand this, and I, you know, I respect it. Um, I don't agree with it. Uh, I think it should be a goal for all the reasons I've, I've outlined. And what I've realized is that um, I, I can't bother them about it anymore uh, because they, they have other, other goals. And, and you know, one of their main goals is uh, you know, getting speakers in quickly and cheaply and you know, putting on a good show. Um, so, uh, so instead, uh, sisters are doing it for themselves, uh, skeptic. Um, now, we, we had our first Skeptic Con, uh, actually the week before TAM, in Minneapolis. At, there's a conference there called Convergence, which is like a sci-fi, fantasy, like comic book crazy thing, kind of like Comic-Con or Dragon Con. Um, and it's, it's a lot of fun, and, and so what we did was we had um, these, these panels, and um, it was all um, women or uh, female-focused. Um, PC was invited, couldn't be bothered to show up because <laughs> I'm kidding, he was stuck in Germany. <laughs> we actually, we piped him in through um, uh, Skype and it was, he was like a talking head. <laughs> it was like Max Hedrum, it was not good. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and, and it was fantastic. And I think that, uh, and it was very well attended. And the great thing about Convergence is that you pay to get into this huge convention and then you can go to any of these millions of talks that you want. So um, word got around that the skeptics had panels there and we are awesome. <laughs> and so uh, we, I think we filled up the room for every single panel we did. And we got a lot of people saying like, oh, hey, actually, no, I, I dig this whole skepticism thing. I'm, I'm gonna get into this. So I think um, what we do is we set, an, we set an example and we show that um, having a bunch of women on stage uh, doesn't mean that you can't pack an audience and entertain them for an hour or two. So uh, I think that as we uh, step up and put more women in the spotlight, that makes those women bigger names, and that means that eventually when the JREF is swinging around and picking up speakers that they know is going to get people to come to Vegas, they're more likely to, to scoop up some women. So. Okay, so I work in a bookstore, and my question is, when somebody wants to go see those crappy Suzanne Summers books in the women's health section, 
what book can I recommend to them, oh, ever so subtly, that will put them in a better direction? Oh, man. <laughs> The antidote to Suzanne Summers is what you're asking me. <laughs> That's not a gun. <laughs> That's I'm not advocating. No, no, no. Cut that out of the video. <laughs> Don't hurt her. She's hurting herself. Um, <laughs> gosh, that's a good question. Um, no, it's tough because I, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of any. Um, any really good uh, skeptical books that are focused on women's health, um, I would simply recommend they go to Skeptic. <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's the best thing I can think of. I, actually, I will tell you, um, it's, not, it's not female focused, but um, one of the, the best um, books I've ever read that combats um, alt-med bullshit is um, Trick or Treatment by my friend Simon Singh and Edzard Ernst. They basically come at alt-med from a believer's standpoint and they begin, like the very start of the book is describing the scientific method and what it does. And if you've never read any of Simon's books, you're missing out. Pick up Fermat's Last Theorem, The Big Bang. Um, he's a brilliant writer, entertaining. He knows how to tell a story. And what he does is throughout this book, bit by bit, he just dismantles um, every alt-med craziness you can think of. And there's even like a little chart that shows herbal medicines um, and their relative effectiveness because some are ever so slightly maybe effective and he'll throw out the evidence for that when, when, it, when he gets to it and, you know, and, and be very honest about that. And I think that, that goes a long way toward convincing believers. So I'd definitely recommend Trick or Treatment. And, and will you do me a favor and reshelve her books to fiction? I think that would. <laughs> uh, first of all, before I ask the question, I want to compliment you on saying vagina so many times. I feel like that word is socially unacceptable, and it shouldn't be. Vagina. Good, <laughs> Thank you. Good word. <laughs> Second of all, I want to ask if you grew up in a family where you were taught to be empowered as a woman, or if you grew up with like a misogynistic dad gets to make all the decision type thing. Um, that's a good question, um, and the answer is neither. Um, I, I grew up, uh, my, my family is religious in that we went to church every Sunday, um, but uh, it wasn't, and, and my mom cried when she found out I'm an atheist. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it, it was never, feminism wasn't a topic that ever came up, um, and I never even really thought about it. Um, in fact, I, never, I didn't think about feminism until very recently. Um, it's only been probably in the last few years that I've realized uh, how important it is and uh, that I am a feminist and that it's, you know, I need to stand up for that, so, yeah. All right, I want to ask about abortion. <laughs> uh, okay. Because I love abortion. Um, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> Um, I actually love arguing abortion. I love discussing why we need it. And I think you made some excellent points about why we need it. But me, me and JT actually differ on how we like to approach that question with people who are consider themselves uh, pro-life. And he comes from the perspective, look, a fetus, clearly we can see it doesn't attain consciousness or anything close until extremely late in the process. You know, it really doesn't affect that many abortions. And I like to say, if you're a resident of my body, <laughs> and I tell you to get the fuck out, you're getting the fuck out. <laughs> um, and I, I, I think that he has a point when he says that his opinion is more accessible to the general public <laughs> um, because I kind of come across as a category one feminist asshole. Uh, but where do you, where like do a, you? <laughs> that, that's like right before tropical storm. <laughs> 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 so what, what's your perspective on, on kind of the two different ways yeah, to approach um, that? that that's, that's a very good question. D, DJ and I talked very briefly about this earlier. Um, and uh, the thing is, uh, you, a lot of uh, the religious rights problem with abortion um, really does come from um, this desire to control a woman's body. Um, women are scary, their sexuality is scary, kill it, kill it, kill it. <laughs> but not the baby. Um, <laughs> but, um, and, and so in that respect, you, know, you have a very good point. It's my body, I do with it as I please. But I think that what you have to understand from their point of view is that they're saving babies. 
And you also, I, I think that we all need to understand that um, at, at some point, you know, it is possible to oppose abortion without being a, a religious fundamentalist. You could oppose abortion, um, you know, especially like a very late term abortion of a healthy uh, fetus that would say, be able to live outside of the mother's body because you feel that at that point it's, it's a life and that life deserves a chance to go on, um, even if the mother hates it. <laughs> um, so, and, and you have to understand that when, you know, when you're talking to somebody, that's what they're gonna be thinking. They're gonna be picturing a baby dying. And I think that that's you know, something to, to take into consideration. And if you, are, if you don't wanna just yell back and forth with them, if you want to have a, a conversation, um, you need to accept those terms and, and go from there. So I would recommend um, backing it up a bit and uh, telling them uh, about the life cycle, <laughs> um, particularly the part about how, you know, um, just because a sperm has entered an egg, it's not a baby, uh, because that's an important idea and it's a, a lot of people have the wrong idea about that. Um, and then work from there. And it might be possible for you to get some sort of middle ground. For instance, you might be able to, you're much more likely to convince them that plan B is safe and effective and not killing babies. In fact, it's doing the opposite. It's saving women from getting abortions. And that's, I think, it's important to find common ground on things like that. So, that's my opinion. Are we done? All right. Thank you, everybody.